A global treaty for the high seas. UN member states try to agree a deal to protect fragile ecosystems in international waters. Why is it important and what has prevented an agreement until now? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Laura Kyle. Countries have tried for years to reach a global agreement on protecting the high seas. These are areas of the world's oceans that fall beyond the jurisdiction of any one nation. Each country has exclusive use of its territorial waters, which run up to 370 kilometers from their shorelines. Those territorial areas are highlighted in light blue on this map. Beyond that, in dark blue, are the high seas, international waters that make up most of our planet's oceans. Scientists say existing laws aren't strong enough to protect those areas. Well, the high seas are crucial for supporting marine life, as well as absorbing carbon dioxide and heat caused by global warming. UN member states are meeting in New York to try to agree on a legally binding treaty. They've been negotiating for the past 10 years. Let's look at why it's so relevant. Two thirds of the world's ocean are considered international waters. That means all countries have a right to fish, ship and carry out research in them. But only 1.2% of these high seas are protected. This means most of the world's marine life is exposed to growing threats from climate change, overfishing and shipping. If countries commit to the treaty, 30% of the world's oceans would be considered conservative conservation areas by 2030. That means that environmental impact assessments will have to be carried out before any commercial activities such as deep sea mining are allowed. Well, at a UN Oceans Conference in June, Secretary General Antonio Guterres said some governments were deliberately stalling progress on a treaty. Egoism. We are dealing with the protection of um, biodiversity in international waters. But some people still think that they are powerful enough to think that international waters should be theirs. I think it's important to make everybody understand that international waters are ours, of all countries and all peoples in the world. Well, let's bring in our guests now. In New York, we have Jessica Battle, senior expert on global ocean policy at the World Wildlife Fund. In London, Danish Mustafa, professor of critical geography at King's College London. And also in New York, Will McCallum, head of oceans at Greenpeace UK. Will is also head of Greenpeace's delegation to the UN in New York. Very warm welcome to all of you. First, I think it's important to address the fact that we're talking about half of our planet left currently unprotected. It's an incredible amount. Will, why is it so important to change that? It's so important to change the status quo because uh, with, we're seeing that threats to the ocean are only increasing. We're seeing threats like overfishing, like illegal fishing, like deep sea mining, all continue to increase and very little action being done to actually protect the, the, the biodiversity out there on the oceans. And I suppose for people sitting back on land, they might wonder, well, why, why does ocean protection matter for me? And, and I'd say, well, all of us depend on a healthy ocean to help regulate our climate, to absorb carbon, to keep us more resilient to the impacts of climate change. But also more than 3 billion people around the world depend on the ocean for their primary source of food. So risking that food security through political inaction simply isn't good enough. And that's why we're here at the United to nations this week campaigning for a strong treaty to be agreed. Mm, we'll certainly talk more about that treaty in just a moment. Danish, just before we do, I mean, this is a part of the world that not many of us get to see, let's be honest. Who does go out there? What sort of activities do we see out on these high seas? Well, there are very few uh, countries in the world that actually have the capability to undertake deep sea mining. It used to be the United States was the only country until the 1990s that had the capacity to go out in the high seas and undertake deep sea mining. Uh, maybe Japan right now has developed that sort of a capability, maybe a couple of other countries, but the United States can, continues to be the largest player in the game when it comes to deep sea mining. 
uh, in fact, practically the only player that is out there. Uh, so when you're really talking about regulation of the high seas, what you're really talking about is a handful of extremely powerful technologically advanced countries, United States being at the, at the forefront of that. So the question of regulating deep sea mining is probably um, intricately connected to domestic politics within the United States, where it becomes uh, politically feasible for an administration uh, to forego an almost exclusive uh, capability that they have to undertake the kind of activity that this uh, treaty is trying to regulate. I mean, uh, Mozambique or South Africa or Pakistan or Bangladesh would happily sign the treaty because they don't have the capability to go out in the, uh, in the high seas and undertake the kind of mining activities. When it comes to deep sea fisheries, again, there are a handful of countries that actually have the factory uh, boats, uh, which have that sort of a range to undertake uh, deep sea blue waters fishing uh, chief amongst them would be again United States, Canada, uh, Norway, Iceland, uh, Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, Korea, and there may be a few others that uh, the other participants are probably mindful of and, and know of. So again, this treaty really is about a handful of countries that can actually do something in the high seas. Mm. So obviously there was a there was a reference in the in the in the clip that you ran earlier that there are some countries which think they are powerful enough to not worry about the rest of the world well let's name the powerful ones right who don't think that it belongs to the rest of the world and since they are the only ones who can get to it I mean, Jessica, right let's just uh, bring you in at this point, because quite quickly, we uh, Danish has honed us in from a global treaty to just a handful of perpetrators. So why don't we just make this a domestic issue and and hone in on these these few powerful countries? Why does it have to involve the whole whole world? Well, because the, the United Nations Law of the Sea Treaty, which is the one under which this treaty is being negotiated, um, actually has 165 parties, I think. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a pretty uh, global treaty. And as you said in your introduction, the high seas belongs to everyone. So we cannot allow only a few countries to exploit uh, these vast areas that have so many benefits for so many people and so many countries' economies as well. Uh, so that it is very, very important that, that almost all these countries become, if not all, become parties, members to this treaty when it's finalized, so that everybody is covered by it and all activities are covered by it. Um, it we, we believe, and this is also what uh, Guterres said, the Secretary General of the United Nations in, in the clip in the beginning, that the ocean beyond national jurisdiction is really the large, the, the last tragedy of the commons, you, you might say. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it really is somewhere where uh, those who can have been exploiting it to the benefit for them, but really at the detriment of, of all of us and, and all of our children's futures as well. So um, we, even though it's, of course, only a few countries who today have the ability to go out there, um, and what they do is that they subsidize, for example, their high seas fishing fleets tremendously. Uh, it's very expensive to, to operate on the high seas. Um, and and they, they catch too much fish. They destroy important uh, habitat, a living space for many um, marine creatures. Um, and they also uh, catch a lot of important species in bycatch, such as uh, iconic species that we have attribute cultural or other values to, like large whales, for example, so turtles. Mm -hmm. um, so really, yes, that it's a, sh uh, a few countries who ac have activities there, but it's all of our interest and responsibility. And well, we know that countries like Australia, New Zealand, blocks like the EU are in favor of this treaty. What about places like America, Japan? Are they on board with it? Over the last uh, round of negotiations that took place in March, we saw that many, if not most, countries were in favour of concluding a treaty. The question is really how strong will that treaty be? And for us as Greenpeace, as uh, environmental campaigners, and I'm sure I share this with others on the call, for us the success of this treaty and its strength will be determined on whether or not it has the power to protect areas of the high seas. Can it actually put areas of the high seas off limits 
to some of these destructive industries we've been mentioning. If it can do that, then we'll consider a, a, a strong treaty. And it remains to be seen how hard the EU in particular are willing to push for this. Mm. We're really worried at the moment and entering into these negotiations in quite a, a tense place, wondering how far will, will countries that have previously been supportive be willing to compromise? Um, because we desperately need that strong treaty, a treaty that can actually deliver ocean protection. The UK government, for example, along with many others, has been traveling around the world campaigning for at least 30% of the world's oceans to be protected by 2030. That's what scientists say is needed to restore fish populations, keep our oceans more resilient to climate change. Now, that target is simply impossible without a strong treaty. We mm. won't get it on that, on, on that scale. And if we don't agree a treaty this year, it also is impossible to protect 30% of the world's oceans by 2030. So the urgency is what we really need to see at these negotiations. So urgency, willingness, and Danish also, we, we need to know how we can protect these oceans. We're talking about places that are very inhospitable, that are very inaccessible. How do we actually police these high seas? Again, uh, just to just to get back uh, to my earlier point, uh, very few countries in the world have the capability to enforce, right? The same countries that have the capability to go out there and undertake deep sea mining or subsidize their uh, deep sea uh, fishing fleets are the ones who also have the capability to actually police those. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting situation that the perpetrators are also the ones which we are also asking to police their behavior. So you can get your treaty, and if the United States doesn't sign it, it doesn't. It's not worth the paper that it's written on. Uh, you can get your. I mean, it's kind of like climate change as well, right? I mean, climate change is a lot more uh, political traction in the European Union, even you know, to an extent, you could argue in the United States, it's in the public eye. But high seas is something that that's very far away from the public's consciousness. Very few people go out there. Very few people get excited about it. And uh, I think that that's that's the sort of uh, paradoxical problem that you have at your hands. So UN can do what it wants and uh, you know, 165, fine, 164 countries sign it and the United States doesn't sign it. Voila, you have a treaty, but so what? I mean, the, the main country that can actually do something about it uh, or uh, is in fact the problem uh, doesn't sign it. So that's end of discussion. That's like saying, let's have a climate change treaty, but not have China or US part of it. Well, that becomes meaningless. Okay, so uh, just, Jessica, that... what's your response to that? I mean, as he was saying, you know, you can get everybody signing it, but how are we actually going to police it? And will the US be willing to police itself? I mean, it's valid points, isn't it? And, and what's the response to that? I don't think we should focus too much on the United States here, because the United States is actually not a party to the Law of the Sea Convention, and it still behaves according to the Law of the Sea Convention. I think what is really important here is, uh, is as, uh, as we heard, that the states who are parties to this treaty, um, they, are, they are obliged to also make sure that the flag, the vessels that they flag, um, all activities on the high seas are taking place on from vessels or on vessels after all, both fishing, potentially seabed mining, shipping, of course, cable laying, don't forget other uh, potential and, and current uses of the ocean, uh, are taking place from, from vessels, from boats. Uh, and these boats have a flag and it's the, it's the flag state that is responsible for the behavior uh, of these vessels. And, mm -hmm. and uh, as we heard, need to police this. Um, so it really is, uh, th this treaty we're hoping can foster better collaboration between these flag states uh, who are signatories to a whole host of other agreements that they also have to implement when, they're, when their vessels, the vessels that they flag uh, are operating on the high seas. Let's not forget, forget other treaties such as the Convention on Migratory Species that was set up to protect uh, uh, animals that that migrate across jurisdictions so from the high seas to national waters, etc. Uh, and we have a lot of fish or some fish species in there, turtles, etc. That is one of those that the, that this uh, that the the flag states also have to make sure uh, are followed. And what we're hoping with this treaty is to establish this strong collaborative mechanism and also um, a, a sense of um, of duty to report what is going on, how are they doing when they're implementing these treaties. So, for example, as Will was saying, if there's a protected area that has been established under this treaty, that these 
flag states are controlling the vessels that they flag in mm. such a way that they do not break that law. Well, still, it's going to run up against some big, powerful interests, isn't it? Let's look at deep sea mining, for example. No license, it, it doesn't happen as yet, but exploratory licenses have been released. How much concern does this raise for you? Because people are going to want to explore the deep sea as resources on land run thin. And as we want to develop renewable energies, we're already finding sources, minerals under the sea that can contribute to that. So there's a conundrum there in itself. How, how does this argument play out? Well, quickly on deep sea mining, I think, uh, Frankly, it, the, there is absolutely no need for deep sea mining. The big tech companies, the big car companies who might need these minerals, they're not calling for deep sea mining. They're actually looking at alternative materials right now. Deep sea mining is being pushed forward by a, a tiny number of cowboy companies uh, who, who desperately want to, to find a new frontier to exploit. So uh, it, it is a concern for us, absolutely, that it's even being talked about seriously. But but um, but really, I think the, the, the other obstacles this treaty faces um, and and sort of how optimistic I am, you know, no one said that, the, that, that deciding the, the fate of half of our planet was going to be a simple task. It's, it's wrought with complexity and, and difficulty, but it's also this most enormous opportunity. And I have a lot of hope going into the next two weeks because the, the science is so clear that when you protect the oceans properly, when you, uh, when you put areas off limits to human activities, when you limit the, the more destructive uh, industries out there, it has this remarkable ability to bounce back, to restore mm. life at a, a, a sort of scale that you just don't see on land. And that that vision of hope, that that idea that 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 protecting it will will all reap the rewards of properly protecting it, I hope is what will drive some governments to really push for the most ambitious treaty they can. I mean, well, I love your optimism and I want to share it, but it's been 10 years of negotiations. What makes you think that this is the year it's going to be agreed? So some pa very powerful countries in the room right now are saying this year is the year. We've seen we're seeing the EU come out as a block saying we have to see a treaty this year. We're seeing other negotiating groups uh, like the Pacific Small Island Developing States, like uh, like the Africa Group, also saying this year is the year. Ultimately, governments don't want to be sending delegations to New York year in year out to debate the future of half our planet. They want to they want to see a result. But it is very disappointing not to see ministers from those countries here. That would really send the signal that this is a political priority. So if in the first few days we're seeing these talks are, are replicating the same cumbersome bureaucratic processes as before, then absolutely we're going to be writing to ministers around the world to say, you have to get here now. You have to come here and make your voice heard and make delegations know that this is a political priority to conclude. Mm. It isn't easy. Of course it's not easy. 165 countries agreeing anything isn't easy but we do believe that that we've put in all of this groundwork for many years and governments here are really ready to agree they want this i'm just wondering will whether you find that it's already been watered down because we have a, a graphic we can show you um greenpeace and the university of york released a study in 2019 on how the oceans could be protected by 2030 now the areas in orange show the high seas that are protected now, and as we said earlier, it's about 1%. And this is what 30% would look like. That's the amount that we're focusing on. They say it is possible to safeguard a full spectrum of marine life without disrupting fishing and commercial activities. Now that 30%, it was brought down from 50%. Danish, do you think 30% is, oh, it's never enough, is it? But is it okay? Is it viable? Is it possible at this stage of the game? I, I'm, I'm no technical expert on fisheries, and I, I, I can't really argue whether 30% or 35% or 25% or what, what, what is a good number for that. Uh, the important problem I'm trying to, and I'm not against the treaty, I think mm. the treaty is a wonderful thing that happens, and I hope that the optimism is well placed and, and it does come through. Uh, my view is, for example, uh, it was just mentioned by one of the uh, participants, and forgive me, I'm not very good with remembering names, uh, that uh, flagged uh, ships are the countries that flag a ship are responsible for the behavior of those uh, vessels. Now, reality is a vast majority, and I, I'm happy to be corrected if I'm misinformed on this count, vast majority of the high seas, 
fishing fleets are actually flagged by Liberia and uh, Panama and these small countries out there, which are basically flags of convenience, which basically means that there are, I mean, Liberia is not going to go out there and police a fishing trawler in the Pacific and, and, and uh, uh, modify its behavior. The other important uh, point that has just been raised is that the law of the sea is not subscribed to by the United States. Uh, again, well, the, therein is your answer. Uh, countries that have the capability to actually have high seas fishing trawlers, fishing fleets, the countries that have uh, deep sea mining may very well be a very minor part of the picture at the moment. In the future, what happens, I don't know. Uh, those are, again, problems of these major countries. And I think that uh, I, can, I can understand the Hawaii colleagues are hesitant to name names or to focus on any one country or the other country. But that's not going to change the reality of the incredible power that a few countries have uh, to create a problem and then to control the problem. And without those, uh, I mean, no one said that uh, Senegal is a problem. No one said that South Africa is a problem or that, I mean, within the territorial waters, they may very well be. But with high seas, there's a very small cast of characters. Mm. And unless we focus on those, uh, you know, pious declarations that it belongs to all of us. Okay, and, I can know, just say, see Will wants to jump, by... jump, to jump in there. Just let's let him jump in. Yeah, I was just going to say, yes, yes, it is a small number of countries that are creating the problems, but it is far more countries who are feeling the impacts. And yeah. that is why we need these multilateral processes. It's to help those countries who might not have the diplomatic power as a single entity by creating these multilateral treaties that, 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 that uh, really deliver a, a common good. So whilst there might not be some individual countries creating problems, perhaps the United States won't ratify this treaty. But countries like Spain, who have one of the largest high seas fishing fleets, who have been lobbying the European Union for a weaker position on fisheries, they will be bound by it and they will stick to it. The okay. same goes for France, who also have a very large international tuna fleet. They will be bound by it. So there are many countries that are active on the high seas who will be bound by this treaty. And also, huge trading blocks like the European Union can, in fact, through trade agreements, keep other countries to the, 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 the confines of these treaties, to the rules of these treaties. So whether or not a country ratifies it, there are still other mechanisms by which countries can okay. be held. And, to and Jessica's uh, wanting to join in, jump in as well. Yes, no, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Will, for that. Uh, I think also what we have to remember here is that this treaty is not being negotiated in isolation. There are, uh, as Will pointed out, there are other treaties. There are also a lot of agreements that governments have signed on to because they have understood that we have a planet that is ailing and that we need to do something about the way we treat this planet. These are the sustainable development goals, for example. Now, these are not legally binding, but they are an aspiration of the international community to make sure that all states uh, either reduce their consumption because they, they consume too much or are able to partake in a sustainable development in, in, in a, a sustainably stewarding the resources we have to our disposal without uh, further deteriorating the marine, marine and, and the natural environment at large. So I think we must remember that, that these are commitments that these countries have also signed up to and we have to hold them accountable which is why we need to make sure, as Will was saying, that there's more political will, more political attention to this treaty at this time. Mm. Jessica, they've, they've got a deadline at the end of this year to reach an agreement on this treaty. What happens if it's not reached? If it is not reached, they will have to, uh, they will have, to have another negotiation session. That is not, not a, a, an impossibility, but of course, during this time, the ocean is continuing to deteriorate. So we do not want to see a whole slew of, of more sessions. Uh, and we would like them to conclude this treaty at this time. But if there are a few small issues still to resolve, then yes, another session might be needed. Uh, but as I said, we can't wait. Uh, okay. The ocean can't wait. Absolutely. OK, we will have to leave it there for the moment. We'll be watching uh, the next few days of this uh, convention very closely indeed. Thanks very much for taking the time to join us. Jessica Battle, Danish Mustafa and Will McCallum. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. 
You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now.